Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation. As the Danube River runs west from the Austrian city of Vienna, it passes through some of the most picturesque scenery in Europe. For over 35,000 years, people have been living on these shores. They were originally attracted to the area because of the mild climate and the ideal conditions for farming. The ancient Romans occupied the region, and when Christianity became the official religion of Rome, the local population slowly gave up its pagan beliefs and built dozens of monasteries on the hills. But a monastery was not just a center for religious activities. The monks were skilled craftsmen, architects, and technicians. They set up permanent facilities that organized the peasants and showed them how to improve their farming, how to build better houses, and upgrade the construction of roads and bridges. When a ruler donated land and money for the creation of a monastery, it may or may not have improved the ruler's value to the Almighty, but it was definitely a mighty improvement in the value of the lands that the ruler ruled. The ideal way to pass through this part of Austria is to travel on one of the river cruises. I sailed on one of the AMA waterway ships. Our AMA cruise manager had an excellent understanding of the local history. The town of Melk was founded as a Roman garrison at the point where the Melk River joins up with the Danube, about 50 miles west of Vienna. In the year 976, the Emperor of Germany chose the Babenberg family to rule the neighborhood, which they did from a series of fortified castles. The castle at Melk was their most important stronghold and became the cradle of Austrian history. The Babenbergs decided to bury their ancestors at Melk and to make sure that the family burial site was cared for properly, they set up a monastery inside the castle. The Babenbergs ruled for just over a hundred years, at which point the castle and the surrounding lands were turned into a Benedictine monastery, and Benedictine monks have been living and working here ever since. For centuries, milk was able to support itself with taxes from the local peasants and a profitable agricultural program on its own land. These days, however, the major source of income is tourism. Each year, almost 500,000 people visit Melk. St. Benedict's motto was pray, work, and read. And the physical structure of Melk is designed to serve these functions. Up until that time, monks were primarily hermits living separately in huts and caves. St. Benedict did that for a while, but then he decided that monks should be together in a community. The Benedictine model is to bring people together in a life of holiness, but at the same time, it should be a life of wholeness. 
he promoted a balanced personality of work, spiritual life, and intellectual advancement. The Benedictine communities became an oasis of learning within Europe, an oasis that preserved the idea of scholarship that was so much a part of the European tradition. The rule of St. Benedict requires that nothing be more important than the worship service, and the Milk Abbey Church clearly reflects that instruction. Work on the church began at the beginning of the 1700s under the direction of Abbot Dittmeyer. Dittmeyer decided that the subject matter of the artwork should be based on the idea that without a just battle, there is no victory. And that theme is reflected throughout the interior. St. Peter and St. Paul in a farewell handshake as they set off to meet their deaths, their final battle. Christ, crowned with thorns, battles through suffering to glory. A panel shows the woman of the apocalypse who battled the dragon. The entire area around the altar represents one idea, God's people battling on the road to salvation. The design reaches its peak in the dome. We see the heavenly Jerusalem, the great victory that follows a just battle. The paintings represent the idea of a journey, a struggle, a spiritual battle in which each individual has to participate. There is no room for the passive bystander. You must be involved. You must be part of the struggle. The Abbey Library is one of the world's finest, with over 100,000 books, including many ancient handwritten and illuminated manuscripts. This book was written in the 1100s and presents elements from the Mass. By the early 1200s, Melk had its own writing room, which produced hundreds of illustrated books. It was probably the inspiration for Umberto Eco's medieval murder mystery, The Name of the Rose. In 2001, the Melk Monastery Museum was built to illustrate the history of the Abbey and to help visitors understand the forces that shaped its past. The most precious treasure and the holiest relic in the monastery is the Melk Cross. It contains a fingernail-sized piece of the Cross of Christ that was given to the Abbey in 1040. The gold screws that hold the two sides of the cross together are the oldest known screws with a right-hand thread, which is now the norm. There's also the lower jaw of St. Coleman. Coleman was the son of an Irish king who was martyred near Vienna in 1012. He was on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but because of his strange language and clothing, he was suspected of being a spy. He was imprisoned, tortured, and hung. Almost immediately, a series of miracles began taking place, and the local population began to view Coleman as a saint. The Badenbergs heard about the miracles and had Coleman's body brought to the castle for a ceremonial funeral. The Badenbergs knew that having the body of a saint in their castle would be considered a divine confirmation of their authority as rulers. Coleman became Austria's first patron saint. The museum represents all the periods in the history of Melk, the good, the bad, and the truly bizarre. Some of the more bizarre stuff came in during the second half of the 1700s when everything was being subjected to what at the time was considered to be logical behavior. In 1784, Emperor Joseph II reached a high point or perhaps a low point, depending on your viewpoint, in terms of logical thinking. He had come to the realization that the Lord wanted the human body to return to the earth ashes to ashes and dust to dust, and that a coffin only stood in the way. 
And so he demanded that all coffins be reusable. This is a model of the reusable coffin he introduced. Once it was lowered into the grave, a pulley opened a trap door in the bottom, and the body remained in the earth while the coffin was pulled up to be used again. Now, as much as Joe loved his reusable coffin, he didn't think it was quite right for emperors. You see, there really weren't that many emperors, and so it wouldn't get used that often, and therefore really wasn't a very efficient piece of equipment for emperors. The Melk Abbey Museum also contains some of the greatest religious art of the late Middle Ages. These paintings were produced as works that would teach the Bible to people who could not read, which was the case for the majority of the population. An excellent example is the painting of the 12-year-old Christ in the temple. Mary and Joseph are looking for him and find him with the scribes. Jesus is sitting on a teacher's chair on the same level as the highest teacher symbolizing that what Jesus says is as important as what the scribe has to say. In addition, the scribe is using a book. Jesus needs no book. He is saying what God has taught him. In the lower right-hand corner is a scribe who has closed his book. During the 1500s, the Protestant Reformation spread throughout Europe and introduced an architectural style that was much less decorative and ornate than what had been in fashion up to that time. Much of the elaborate art and sculpture was removed from the Catholic churches, which were being converted for use by Protestants. Baroque art and architecture was the Catholic Church's response to the simple decorative style of the Protestant Reformation. The Baroque got started in Italy during the late 1500s and continued for about 200 years. The object was to build a church that was so elaborate and so ornate that it overwhelmed the observer. It asked, where do you think God really belongs? In that plain, undecorated, modest Protestant church or in this magnificent structure? The architect was trying to evoke an emotional response. Elaborate decoration was essential. For a Baroque artist, more was never enough. A favorite element was a scene from the Bible that was so powerful that it inspired conversion. The ceilings of Baroque churches were often covered with scenes of heaven, suggesting that the church was the only reliable road to salvation. The Baroque was propaganda in the form of art and architecture. You looked up at the ceiling of a Baroque church and you saw the coming attractions. The art was a call to action. Step this way, there's immediate seating in the balcony and our operators are standing by. The style was not limited to churches. This was a period when the kings of Europe were consolidating their power and a monumental Baroque palace clearly indicated who was in charge.
Vienna was built at the crossroads of two major trade routes. The north-south axis was the Amber Road that went from northern Germany to Greece. The east-west traffic was handled by the Danube River. The Danube was essential for the growth of international trade. Vienna got rich because the city controlled the traffic heading downriver. And Vienna was controlled by the Habsburgs. The Habsburg family came to power at the end of the 1200s and hung on to it for almost 700 years. This is Schönbrunn Palace. It was their summer place. Now, most royal families increased their land and their power by using military might. But the Habsburgs used marriage. It all started when Maximilian married Mary, the daughter of the Duke of Burgundy, which added the Netherlands and Luxembourg to his lands in Austria. And Max's son Phil married Joan, the heiress of Castile. And that got him Spain and Naples and Sicily and Sardinia and all the newly acquired Spanish lands in the Americas. These guys were getting married all over the place and getting all the places where they got married. But at one point, they made a fatal mistake. In order to avoid anybody marrying a Habsburg and getting their land, they started marrying each other. A genetic disaster. It's good to have a close family, but not that close. Swimming in the same gene pool made them weirder and weirder, and in the end, they lost everything. Fortunately, what they lost is now on display to the public. Our AMA cruise manager arranged for a tour of the palace. Robert Tidmarsh has been a senior guide to Schönbrunn Palace for over 20 years. This room is the so-called Marie Antoinette room. It dates back to the time of the emperor. What we've done is to try to show the public what a dining room was like at the time of the emperor. The napkins are the so-called Kaiser Serviette. They're shaped similar to a fleur-de-lis. They were used or are used for the head of state. Even today, when we have a state reception, if the president of Austria gives a reception, then they will use the Kaiser Serviette. If it's the chancellor, then they don't. The master of ceremonies chose the length of the candles. So if it was going to be a long reception, he would use long candles. If it was going to be a short reception, the short ones. Most of the people that came to a state reception were Austrians that had been to thousands of receptions before, and they would automatically look at the chandeliers to see how long the reception was going to take. The emperor ate very quickly, which is not quite true. If he did, he would have looked like me. He ate very little and finished very quickly. And that led to a problem. As soon as the emperor stopped eating, everybody else was obliged to stop. Most of the restaurants near to Schumbrunn or near to the Hofburg or the hotels knew about the problem. They knew that the reception would, would be over very quickly, and they were getting ready for the end of the reception. And the end of the reception would have been that moment as soon as the emperor stopped eating, and everybody left the Hofburg or, or Schumbrunn and went to the next best hotel for a meal. After our tour of the Schönbrunn Palace, the AMA cruise manager made arrangements for us to visit one of Vienna's traditional coffee houses. Coffee originated in Ethiopia, and by the 6th century, Arab communities in the area were cultivating coffee. The Muslim sect called the dervishes loved the stuff. They realized that when they drank coffee, they had more energy and they were able to stay up longer. That gave them more time at prayer, so they figured it was a gift from God. They called it kava, which is where our word coffee comes from. Muslim armies attacked Vienna in 1683. When their siege failed and they headed back to the Near East, they left behind sacks of coffee beans. The Viennese discovered them, figured out how to brew the beans, and opened up their first coffee house. 
A coffee house is a place to read the newspaper, play a game of billiards, have a light meal or a dessert, a glass of wine, and definitely a cup of coffee. The waiters in a true Viennese coffee house will be dressed in tuxedos, and they will offer you over 20 different types of coffee. And with each cup, there will be a small glass of water to aid your digestion. Vienna is the epicenter of European baking and famous worldwide for its pastries and cookies. The official home of Vienna's cookie monster is Demel. Demel got started in 1786 when a confectionery assistant settled in Vienna and started selling decorated baked goods. His shop, which served coffee and hot chocolate along with the pastries, became a gathering spot for the local aristocracy. The last day of the cruise was spent in Budapest, which is actually made up of three cities, Buda, Pest, and Obuda. These days, Budapest is a peaceful, beautiful, and culturally interesting city, which has managed to hold on to much of its history while adapting to the needs of a modern capital. This is the Castle Hill area. The capital of Hungary was originally a few miles up the river on a flat plain that was almost impossible to defend. During the middle of the 1200s, the Mongol Tartars, who had become wealthy as a result of their invention of tartar sauce, invaded the town and destroyed it. So the next time a town was built in the neighborhood, it was put up on a steep hill. Good move, safer neighborhood. The hill is about 200 feet high and about 5,000 feet long and it holds an entire city district filled with historic houses. The district also contains the Matthias Church. The original church on this site was put up in 1255 for use by the German residents of Buda. At the time, it was known as the Church of Our Lady, but people started calling it the Matthias Church after it was used for the first wedding of King Matthias in 1463. Matthias used it again for his second wedding to Beatrice of Naples. And I'm sure if he had a third wedding, it would have been here too. He loved getting married in this church and he was getting a fabulous deal from the florist. Next to the church is an equestrian statue of St. Stephen, who converted to Christianity in the year 1000 and became the first king of Hungary. There's a story that the number of legs connected to the ground on an equestrian statue is related to the way in which the rider died. One hoof raised means the rider was wounded in battle. Two hooves raised means death in battle. And all four hooves on the ground means the rider survived all battles unharmed. This is a very popular story, but not always true. It depends on when and where the statue was made and who made it. Behind the statue is an area known as the Fisherman's Bastion. During the 1200s, each group of tradesmen were responsible for defending a part of the city wall, and this was the part defended by the fishermen. The spot has a great view of the Danube and Pest. The building that dominates the Pest Bank is the Parliament. When we finished our tour of Budapest, we headed back to our ship where we celebrated our last evening on board. Well, that's river cruising on the Danube. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. For a printed copy of this show, send a stamped envelope and $3 to this address. Please mark envelope with show number. The same information is available free on BertWolf.com.
Travels and Traditions with Bert Wolf is brought to you by the BMW European Delivery Program, a way to experience the roads that BMW was made to drive. BMW European Delivery Program. And by Swiss International Airlines, flying to over 70 worldwide locations. Truly Swiss made. Swiss International Airlines. And by Sherry Lehman on Park Avenue in New York City, offering wines for over 75 years with an inventory of wines from all over the world. SherryLehman.com And by the Signet Foundation, raising funds for those in need through art-related initiatives, contributions to UNICEF, and animal welfare organizations. The Signet Foundation.